Good morning. It's good to have you all here with us this morning, and it's good to see your whole face. 19 months I'm looking at from here up on y'all. So it is so good to have you all here with us this morning. Uh, special welcome to Hilda and Danny uh, Sullivan and their granddaughter Emily. They are dear friends of ours from the Gas Bay Coast and they're down for the weekend in Moncton and uh, they watch us online here and there. So uh, it's good to have you guys with us. Uh, special welcome to you as well, sir. Um, thank you for dropping in with us today and a special welcome to you all. Um, we're here to, to worship the Lord today and to fellowship with each other. But let me go over a few things first. Hopefully this is the last time I have to say COVID-19. But as you know, New Brunswick is now gone green. Emergency order has been lifted and there are no restrictions. However, we as church leadership thought we're not going to abandon everything all at once. Um, just because of comfort and safety of you folks and our neighbors here in town. Um, some of the things that we are going to keep is we're going to keep sanitizing all the, the high touched areas, doorknobs, counters and the such. Uh, pews we do not have to sanitize and clean after every service any longer. Um, communion Sunday is today. As much as we love serving each other, we are going to continue to use these little packets that we have been using for the last 18 plus months. Um, maybe September, October, we'll go back to the way that uh, we used to do it, but for now we are going to continue on with these. And offering plates will remain at the back, so if you would like to give some tithes or offerings, you can do so on the back shelves that are back there. And um, masks. Masks are optional. If you want to wear a mask, feel free. If you don't want to wear a mask, that is your choice as well um, because it's all about your comfort and your safety and how you feel. And when it comes to vaccinations versus non-vaccinations, here at Salem, we have decided whether you're vaccinated or not, you are welcome to Salem Baptist Church. Um, that is a private health decision of the individual person so it can remain private if you wish. Um, so if you're vaccinated, welcome. If you're not vaccinated, welcome to you as well. Um, so that's all concerning uh, COVID-19 today. We can sing without our masks. So let's lift the rafters this morning. Um, but a couple more announcements. You've seen them flipping through your screen there, but Wednesday men's practice here at the church. Um, you can bring your own meal, just like we've been doing. And uh, Lord willing, next month, we may go back to a public restaurant like we were doing. But this Wednesday at 9 a.m. is our men's breakfast here at the church. Next Sunday morning is invite someone to Sunday service. Um, so if you have a friend, a neighbor, a family member, um, feel free to invite them and they can come out and see what we're all about and have a great time with them as well. And then you'll notice our prayer focus, our missionaries, those with health problems. Good to see Kathy with us this morning. Um, she's on the mend. Uh, continue to pray for Kevin. He's still in the hospital. Pastor Dan Basham, he's still battling Lyme disease down there in the States. And uh, missions conference coming up in September. Mark the date, September 10th to 12th. Um, September 10th at 6.30, we will be having a gospel concert down at the Bill Johnson Memorial Park and Brother Ed Seely will be here with us. Um, so we'll do a concert there. On Saturday morning at 9.30, we'll be having a breakfast together, and I'll give you more details on that. And the cost of breakfast for you and a person that you bring with you is going to be zero. Um, we are going to look after all that and everything else. And then that Saturday night, we'll have a service here, Sunday morning, a service here, and we'll finish our conference and everything Sunday afternoon with a barbecue picnic type thing out at Malcolm and Gail Reed's, followed by an evening service campfire type thing. Um, so it's going to be a great weekend. So schedule your weekend for just that. You're not allowed to go away. You're not allowed to get sick. You're not allowed to do nothing but come. 
Okay, so that will be on September 10th to the 12th. And we have a birthday today. Okay, we have a carrot cake day today. <laughs> so happy birthday to our brother David. Um, and then this coming Saturday is Gertrude's birthday in the nursing home. Um, we can't visit her, so maybe do up a card and drop it off to Drew and they can get it to her or something like that. Um, let's stand and sing, shall we? Number 319, if you're using a hymn book, Near the Cross. <clears throat> just thanking you for all you do for us. You are such an awesome, wonderful God. And Lord, we thank you for this past week and all the blessings you bestowed upon us, all the provisions you gave to us. And Lord, again, you have done so many things for us that we are not even aware of, and we are so grateful. Thank you for the love that you have for each and every one of us. Thank you for the grace you bestowed upon us and your mercy. Thank you that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are eternally secure and we will never, ever lose our salvation. You look at us as if we're already in heaven. And Lord, 
What a thought that is. And Lord, may we never, ever lose the wonder of it all. That we can talk to Almighty God. We worship the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who left the splendors of heaven and came to this sin-cursed earth to live here, but ultimately to die here, to pay the punishment, the penalty for our sin so that we can have our sin forgiven, so that we can have a relationship with him, so that we can, can go to heaven to be with you for all eternity. What a wonderful, blessed hope we have. We thank you for the promises that you make to us, knowing that they can be trusted, knowing that you have never broken a promise and you never will. So Father, it is truly a joy to be here today in your host with your people. And Lord, may we leave this place just rejoicing because we were here this morning. Father, there are many who couldn't be here this morning for whatever reason. There are some who are not feeling well. There are some of our dear friends who are in the nursing homes, Father. There are some who are away. We bring them before you this morning asking that you just show yourself to them in a mighty way, that you would bless them, you would encourage them. Be with our sister Lois, Lord, as she's still having a problem with her jaw and a tooth that she had looked after several times. And a month ago, they looked at it again and did some work and it's still not healing. So just be with her. Uh, thank you that Kathy could be here with us this morning. We've been praying for her, Father. Continue to touch her body and heal her body, Lord. And Lord, we, we also think of Kevin in the hospital today. Lord, just be with him, be with the doctors. May they get all the tests that they need done, and may he be able to go back home soon. And Lord, we also think of our brother Don, who's looking for a place to live for October, Lord. We just pray that you would open doors there for him, that he could find a place that he would like to be and a place that would be close to us so he can continue to come and fellowship and worship with us. So Father, we just thank you for, for everything you do. And today we ask, as we, we look into your word, that your Holy Spirit would speak to each and every one of us in a powerful way. He would speak to our hearts and our minds. And Father, as we celebrate the Lord's table, help us to remember what you have gone through for us and help us to also look forward to that day when you come to return to take us home. So Father, just bless us this morning. We ask in Jesus' most precious name, amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bible, turn with me to our scripture reading this morning, which is found in Psalm 149, and Psalm 150. Uh, that means we have finished our reading of the Psalm, which we started when we started here back in September of 2018. So here we are finishing that up. Where we go next week, you'll have to come and see. Um, if you would like to join in with me, you can read, we can read together the yellow words and I'll read the white. So Psalm 191 verse one says, praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen, the punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. 
Praise him upon the high standing symbols. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. It's time to greet the family. And for the last 19 months, we would stand and we would wave. Uh, we can shake hands and hugs today if you feel comfortable. And as if you've seen the video I posted on, on Friday, if you do not feel comfortable shaking a hand or hugging and you see one of those huggers coming, <laughs> jot out the elbow and they can do an elbow bump or the such. All right, so if you feel comfortable doing that, let's take a few moments and just greet one another in love. <laughs> yep, I'm good with elbows. We're doing elbows, good. I take your hand. Oh, all right, good to see you. <laughs> so good to see you. You too. This guy looks familiar. Everything I say, they hear. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah, just go on. Good morning. Good morning. Ooh, turn that off for me. Good morning, mother in law. <laughs> I said nobody knew what to do there for a minute. I know. Like deer in headlights. <laughs> yes, because they didn't turn it off on me. Doesn't that feel good being semi back to normal? Amen. 323 at the cross.
can hear you nice and loud and clear without them things over your mouth. And I was just thinking, I'm going to miss the mask, believe it or not, because when I took the mask off when I was standing up here, I would put it there and I could put my remote on it and my remote wouldn't slide. But now it does. I'm going to ask our men to come and join us as we partake of the Lord's Supper. And as they come, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'll start at verse 23. It says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, or many have died. We see a lot of instruction in this small portion of scripture, don't we? We see the instruction to remember. To remember what Jesus Christ went through on that cross. Remember what his body went through. Remember that his blood was shed for the remission of sin. We see that in his word. We're also to anticipate. We're to remember until he comes. So we are to anticipate his return. I believe the Lord is coming back soon. All we have to do is look around the world, see what's going on and stuff, and I believe he is going to come back soon. So we need to be ready for that. And as believers, one way that we are ready for that is by examining ourselves. Another instruction that we are given here. To examine yourself, well, what does that mean? That means that I take a good look at me, not at the person next to me or anybody else, but I examine myself. And if there's anything in my life that I need to deal with, now would be the time to do it before we participate in the Lord's Supper. And that might mean that, hey, I have something against a brother or sister in Christ and I need to deal with that. And that may mean I cry out to God now and say, God, I know that there's an issue between me and so-and-so, and I got to deal with that. As soon as we're done here, 
Give me opportunity to do that. Or even yet, we may even just get up out of our seat and go to that person and get things straight with that person before we participate. That might even mean we don't participate today. So we are to examine ourselves. And if there's any sin that doesn't involve other people, we are to examine that. We are to confess that. And the great thing is that he tells us, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does that mean he can do it right now? It sure does. So examine yourselves. And then we will participate in these symbols. And let's remember that this wafer and this juice is not the literal body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a symbol. The bread is a symbol of his body and what it went through. The fruit of the vine, the juice, is a symbol of his blood. And there's great power in that blood, isn't there? Soul-cleansing power in that blood of Jesus. So to participate this morning, let me encourage you, if you are not a believer, you've never trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior to forgive you from your sin. This watch what we do, because we see a strong warning there. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to ourselves. Without Christ, none of us are worthy. It's all because of him. But the good news is this. As we take a few moments to examine ourselves, a person can cry out to God and say, God, I know I'm a sinner, because we all are. I know I've done things that I shouldn't have done. And I know you sent your son Jesus to die in my place for those sins. And I ask you now to become my Lord and Savior. Forgive me for those sins. Help me to be obedient to you. And he will. And it's not the prayer that saves us. It's the genuine heart. I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior today. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So let's take a few moments and do exactly that. Examine ourselves. And then I'll ask our brother uh, Bruce to give thanks for the Lord's broken body. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege you have to meet here this morning with one another. We thank you, Lord, for this moment that we have the privilege, Lord, to think about you, your body, your shed blood. I thank you, Lord, for each one here this morning. And Lord, we want to celebrate the sacrifice you made on Calvary's cross. Sacrifice, Lord, that we really can't understand. The fact that you would do such a thing for each one of us. So, Lord, I thank you this morning for the broken body. I just pray this morning, Lord, that we would all be here, Lord, in unity and love and praise for you. And uh, just thank you, Lord, for our pastor here. And pray for him, Lord, as he delivers the message this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, my body, this is my body, which is broken for you. He didn't say, peel back the top layer, but we have to. But let's take this wafer as a representation of his body, and let's eat together in remembrance of him. I'm going to ask our brother David to give thanks for the Lord's shed blood. Father God, we are so grateful that we can be here in this place this morning. Thank you that we can take this time to reflect, to remember, to confess if we need to. And we thank you that we can take this time to celebrate as well. 
celebrate the fact that our Savior Jesus Christ went to the cross, that he shed his blood to cleanse us from sin, and also that we have the promise of eternal life when we trust him. Thank you for these things this morning. And Father, may we leave this place excited about what you have done and will do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus said, this is my blood which is shed for many. Let's drink together in remembrance of him. Father in heaven again, we are truly grateful for what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. We thank you that he willingly, obediently went to the cross. He endured the shame with joy, knowing what his death would accomplish. And Lord, not only are we thank you for his beatings and whippings and scourging and that spear through his side, and his death, but we are also thankful for his resurrection. Because Jesus rose from the grave, just like he said, we have victory. We are victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ. The payment for our sin, the punishment have, of our sin has been paid in full, and we are so, so thankful. So Father, help us to remember each and every day of our lives what you went through for us, Help us to serve you the way that we ought to. Help us to represent you the way that we should. And Father, may we live a life that is pleasing to you. And we want to do that because we love you. We thank you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Thank you, Jim. I'll invite you to stand as we sing our next hymn. 309, I will sing of my Redeemer. Yeah.
free. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3. And we're going to pick up in the section that we were looking at last week in Hebrews chapter 3. And we have been looking at verses 7 through 12. And the section that we were looking at here is the second warning that the author of Hebrews was given to the people. And the first warning that he gave, he was instructing them not to drift from the word of God. And drifting simply means don't neglect the word of God. And some people have done that and some people today are doing that, are they not? And that is the first warning of the five that are given in this book. And as we look at all five of them, we see that it's a progression. We drift from the word. We start neglecting the word. That brings us into the second warning that we are talking about where it says, don't doubt God's word. Once we start neglecting it, then we start doubting it. Then we start distrusting the word of God. And the author here is saying, do not do that. And this is the longest warning that he gives. It's from chapter 3 to 7 down through chapter 4 to 16. So it's the longest instruction, but just before he starts it, there's a, like a, a parenthesis there. And he's saying, don't be like the people of Israel. Don't be like your forefathers, more or less, is what he's saying. And he says, remember the provocation. And we looked at the provocation, how that is in some translations, it says the rebellion. Others was, that is where, the word has just slipped right out of my mind. Someone help me. I said it last week. Provoked me. It's where they provoked God. He's saying, don't do that. Don't doubt my word, but trust me. But trust me. That's what we are called to do, are we not? To trust him, to trust in his word. And just to back up a little bit from where we were last week, we remember that God had led these people by a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. And it should have been very clear to them, shouldn't it, that they were right where God wanted them to be. If they were where the pillar of fire was at night, that's where God wanted them to be. If they were where the, the cloud was in the day, that's where God wanted them to be. But then we see there was no water for the people to drink. No water. Two million people with no water. Would you say that's a problem? Ever have a dry well and had no water? You might have a household of four or five people. And with no water, that can be a problem. I remember when we lived in Quebec, we had a well, and then we came here, and we were on town water. And people were saying, when the power goes out, you know, fill up your bathtub so you have water and all this sort of stuff. Because water, or the lack of, is a problem. It's a problem. But every problem that we face is a test from God. It's a test from God. Why? To make you and I stronger. To make us stronger. He gives us tests to strengthen our faith. No water is a serious problem in the desert with two million people. God gave them this problem for a reason, and the reason was this, to help them to focus on him, to help them to focus that he delivered them once and more than once by his power, and he could care for them now. He wanted them to trust him. And when we have different trials and tests in our life, that is God saying to us, hey, 
I want you to trust me. I've proved myself in the past, hasn't he? And I will do it again because I care for every one of you. He wanted them to trust him. Two million people, livestock in the desert with no water. What should they have done? Trust him. Did they have a promise that God would provide for them? Yes, they did. Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 16 tells us, was no water in the desert a problem for God? No, it wasn't. They had just seen miracle after miracle after miracle. Think about what these people have witnessed. They saw the 10 plagues when they were in Egypt. They left Egypt. They got to the Red Sea and God parted the Red Sea. They crossed the Red Sea. And as I was looking at the Red Sea, you know in our Sunday school stories and and Bible picture books and stuff like that, we have the parting of the Red Sea and it's a smooth path going right across. That's not what it was like. When the Red Sea parted, it was like they were climbing over hills and rugged areas and stuff like that to get to the other side. So it wasn't clear sailing for two million people to go through this land with all their livestock and everything else. But yet God provided them a way. And they seen all these things over and over and over. Imagine being there with Israel and seeing all that they have seen. And now you are at Raphidim, where we left off last week, and there's no water. There's no water. What would you do? What would you do? What would I do? What we should do, and what they should have done, was to thank the Lord for providing for them all along the way. They should have trusted in him to provide for them right now. They should have realized that this is another great opportunity for us to see God working. And aren't we looking for opportunities to see God working all the time? Yes, and he does. We need to trust him. But notice how these people responded. Back to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17 verses 2 to 6 we'll read. Exodus 17, verse 2. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses. In other words, they complained with Moses or to Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide you or why are you complaining to me? Wherefore, do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod. Wherewith thou smotest the river, take it in hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock of uh, rock in in, uh, Horeb, and they shall and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So that's an amazing thing. The people start complaining. The people start murmuring. Moses goes to God, what should I do? God tells him exactly what to do. And then we see in verse 7, so he called the name of that place Massa and Meribeth because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? What a question, isn't it? Is the Lord really among us or not? He did all these wonderful things for us. 
And then they have the nerve to say, is God for us or is he against us? And the church today is like that, aren't they? Yes, I'm not saying Salem is because we're perfect and all. But the church in general is like that today. They want to do their own thing. They don't want to trust God. They want a preacher that will come and tickle your ears and preach for five minutes. They want the big old worship bands and everything else. And going to church is more like a concert. Isn't it? Now, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with guitars and drums and all that sort of stuff. But when it takes over everything and it's more into entertaining than worshiping God and serving God and looking into God's word then that's an issue. And isn't Canada like that? God, go away. God, we don't want you here. We don't want you in our schools. We don't want you in our government. We don't want you in the public place. We don't want you in the church. And then something goes wrong. A pandemic hits. God, where are you? I'm exactly where you wanted me to be, out of the way. I don't believe God would ever say that, but that's what people think. We need to trust in him because we have seen him work in wonderful ways, and he's going to continue to do so, and we need to trust him, not murmur and not complain. And that word massa means testing, and meribeth means complaining. Meribeth in the Hebrew means rebellion. They tempted the Lord. Is God among us or not? That tells us that there's an evil heart of unbelief. They're doubting God. They're doubting what God said. And we're instructed, don't do that. Don't drift from God's word. Don't neglect it. Now, don't doubt God's word. Trust him. So now we move from Raphidim, and we go to a similar situation in Kadesh. And Raphidim is near Egypt, and Kadesh is near the place where God was sending the Israelites near Canaan. Let's jump over to Numbers 13. Numbers 13. 13, starting at verse 31. Numbers 13, 31. But the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they searched Onto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people we saw are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants, and we in their own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. You know what these people had? They had a grasshopper complex. That's what they did. They were walking by sight. They were walking by sight, which ends in defeat. Grasshopper is quite an exaggeration here. What's the comparison? The average Israelite man was about five feet tall, which makes me feel kind of good. I'm taller than the average Israelite, okay? Five feet tall, which means that these people, these giants that they saw in this land, would have to be 300 feet tall to make them look like grasshoppers. 
So would you say a little bit of an exaggeration going on here? I would think, have you ever done that? Exaggerated a problem? How about this phrase? I'll never get through this. I'll never get through this. Trust in God. Trust in him and we will get through anything. Anything. But then we had Joshua and Caleb. These two guys, they wanted to trust God. They didn't have the grasshopper complex. They weren't like, hey, these guys are going to devour us. Hey, if you only saw how tall they were, they are like 300 feet tall. And here we are, just five feet. We have no chance. But Caleb, Joshua, they wanted them to trust God. Look at Numbers chapter 4, starting at verse 7. It says this, And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. If the Lord delight in us, he will bring us into this land. Oh, I read that one. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. The Lord's with us. We don't have to fear them. Do you remember David? Another short Israelite guy facing a giant? I don't fear you, Goliath. The Lord, God Almighty, is with me. He's with us. And Caleb and Joshua are saying the same thing. The Lord is with us. Don't fear them. Let's look at their response. Let's look at the response. I overshot there. So verse 10, it says, But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Boy, that's quite the reaction, isn't it? Hey, guys, let's trust God. He proved himself before. Don't fear these people. And they wanted to stone them. That's not a good response. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this, will this people provoke me? They keep provoking me. They keep rebelling against me. They keep disobeying me. How long are they going to do this? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have shown among them. I've done all these great things for them. How long is it going to take them to believe me and trust in me? And God could be saying the same thing in 2021. I have done all these things for these people. How long will it be before they believe me? How long will it be before they trust me? How long will it be before they stop rebelling against me? How long? And then we jump down to verse 22 and 23. Surely, or because all these men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. And then down to verse 27. How long shall I bear with the evil congregation with murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. 
Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. And all that be numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upwards, which have murmured against me. Wow. God's not putting up with rebellion anymore, is he? Just think of this for a moment. Let's say there was, out of the 20 million people, or 2 million people, let's say there was 1.2 million that were over the age of 20. So 1.2 million people, that's a lot, isn't it? And there was approximately 14,500 days in the period of time where they were in the wilderness in that 40 years. That means that on an average, 85 people died a day. 85 people. Now, if we allow 12 hours maximum of a day to do funerals, can you imagine doing funerals for 12 hours a day? So let's say just for 12 hours a day, that means there would be an average of seven funerals an hour for 39 years. 39 years. Now, if that wasn't a constant reminder to the people of their rebellion and their disobedience, I don't know what would be. For 39 years, seven of your friends or family members were buried an hour, 12 hours a day for 39 years. They spent a lot of time burying their dead. Now we go to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation. Again, no water. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. So this is about 39 years later, and the next generation faces the same trial. They face the same test, no water. God has been caring for them for 40 years. Their shoes did not wear out. He provided them food. He provided everything they needed. So now we're back to a situation where there was no water. Will they trust God this time? Will they trust God this time? Let's look at verse 3. And the people chawed with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died with our brothers, died before the Lord. And why have ye brought us, or brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die here? And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt, to bring us in this evil place? It is no place of seed, or of figs, or of vines, or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. Then verse 13, this is the water of Meribeth, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. What is the issue at Meribeth again? The test. Will you trust me? Will you believe my word? God has given us so many promises, hasn't he? He's given us so many promises. Are we trusting in those promises? I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will give you eternal life. 
I will forgive your sin. If you confess, I will forgive and I will cleanse you. And the list goes on and on of all the promises that God gives us. Do we believe them? Do we trust them? We need to know the promises that God gives so that we can believe in them. We need to know them. And we also need to be consistently reminded of them. We know Romans 8.28, yes. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things aren't good. Isn't that true? Getting a flat tire at 2 o'clock in the morning with nobody around and no spare tire in your car, that's not good. Being sick is not good. Not for me, anyway. Ask Betty Lynn. I'm the worst person in the world to be around when I'm sick. All things aren't good, but they work together for good if we love God. They work together for good. God brings us into difficult circumstances so that we can learn to trust him more. That's why he tests us. That's why we have trials. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 tells us, Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. We have a hard time with that, don't we? We do, if we're honest with ourselves. We would rather worry and fret than just cast all our cares upon him. And that's another promise. Cast your cares upon me because I care for you. So what's that verse saying? Don't worry, don't complain, trust. And I think I said that a lot over the last 18 months, did I not? Let's not fear COVID, but let's trust God. He's in control. Oops. He's in control. Trust him. He can bring water out of a rock. He can take money out of a fish's mouth. And God is glorified when we trust him. He's glorified. Let's not act as if he doesn't exist. Some people are like that. Some Christians are like that. I have my salvation. I'm good. I don't need anything else, and I don't need anybody else. I just need my passport from hell, and off I go. Let's not be like that. We need him. We sing that hymn. We need him every hour. But I think if I was to write that song, we need you every minute and every second of every hour. We need him him. Let me finish up with this. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7. This is where we were this morning and last week. It says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, and that's not a 24-hour period of time, that means now, if you will hear his voice, so if you will hear his voice now, that's what we need to do. We need to listen to his voice. And how do we do that? By being in the word of God. That's how he speaks to us, through the word of God. You want to hear God speak? Open your Bible and read. Do you want to hear God speak aloud to you? Open your Bible and read out loud. He speaks to us through his word. So what the Holy Spirit is saying today, listen to his voice. Later on tonight, it means the same thing. Now, listen to his voice. Tomorrow, now, listen to his voice. Don't doubt God's word. Don't distrust God. Listen to his voice. And Hebrews 3, 8 says, Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion and in the provocation, which we just spent almost two weeks looking at. 
Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial. Don't harden your hearts. So that's the second instruction he gives. Stop. If you are already doubting God's word, stop. Right now. And listen to his word. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your hearts in an act of rebellion. Trust him and him alone. He is in control. Listen to his voice and not the voice of what's going on in the world around us. And a lot of people over the last 19 months have been listening to our governments and our health professionals, which is great, we have to. But we cannot neglect God's word. Open your hearts, open your minds, listen to God's word, and don't harden your hearts in an act of rebellion. Trust him. Father in heaven again, what a privilege it is to be in your house with your people. And what a privilege it is to sit under your word. And Father, help us not to be like the Israelites who have seen you do miracle after miracle after miracle, how you provided for them and cared for them. Yet over and over and over, they rebelled against you and did not trust you. Help us to be people who trust you. Help us to be people who trust in your word. And as we looked at Wednesday night, Father, help us to be an Obadiah, one who worships God and God alone. So help us to listen for your word and to your word and help us not to harden our hearts towards your word. But may we meditate on it, delight in it, love it, learn it, and live it. So Father, thank you for being a God who is in complete control and a God that we trust completely in. So thank you for all you do for us and what you're going to continue to do for us. In Jesus' most precious name I pray, amen. Let's stand and sing our last hymn this morning, shall we? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. 571. and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey but we never can prove the delights of his love until all and obey.
how to trust and obey. And all God's is that the last verse? It is now, they took it off the screen. So, so God bless you folks. Have a great week, and Lord willing, we'll see you tonight at 6 p.m.